unfortunately we had to cancel, so it's really nice to be able to have it again. Um, and as with all of our talks, they will be available um, online afterwards as recording, so you'll be able to listen back. Um, so the subject today is um, Kilmaino, Old from Dublin, and many of you will be familiar with Michael O'Flanagan, who, um, who's been here many times and is giving a talk with us today. Um, at the end, there'll be a chance for asking a few questions. Under normal circumstances, we'd then decamp to one of the other rooms for tea and coffee, but unfortunately that won't be possible today because of the restrictions, so I really apologise about that, but hopefully it won't be too long before we can get back to normal and have our tea and coffee again. So I'm going to hand over to Michael and enjoy the talk. Beautiful. 
great royals that shared in those days all around this district. The red deer prayers in the evening are slept at midday in the corner of the woods. On the street, on the uh, the store, the human presence. The kingfisher dies on the banks of the command and the heart sorrow open. Oh, okay. See, please don't think. No, please don't even do it. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I'll do that. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Sorry about that. Yeah. The king's fish are dying on the banks of the Kamak and the hawks are in the open seeking his quarry. It was an ideal spot within the side of the Dublin Mountains, in the shadow of the woods and by the river. Here St. Mine and his monk and his monks built their church on a settlement. And soon amid the solitude of their thriving, there was, they had a thriving community. St. Mine and his monks kept the fire lining at Kamehameha for 25 years, while at the same time travelling around Ireland, doing pilgrimages and visiting other saints. St. Mine lived in the first half of the 7th century. His father, Abe, died in 606. All our information about St. Moynihan derives from the vernacular, and it was only written down in 1480. It was written in Irish. However, the accounts are so specific and so detailed that they are inherently credible. St. Moynihan was a contemporary of St. Mayoron of Tala. All of and uh, St. Finnan of Stratford Lock and St. Dublither of Finnish, all of whom he visited. He also went with St. Finn to, to the Arden Islands. St. Moyne had a following of 27 monks at Kamehameha and they travelled with him on his various pilgrimages throughout the country. On one occasion, St. Moyne is said to have preached to Dermot, High King of Ireland. Moynihan was described as being renowned from Shannon to Holt as a tower of piety. However, St. Mayoruna uh, regarded St. Moynihan as lazy because he was long to engage in manual war. St. Moynihan went to Tala to make his confession. St. Mayoruna is recorded as complimenting St. Moynihan and praising him, praising the perennial fire which he kept alive as follows. Thy successors, See great prerogatives shall be long in Ireland, thy far shall be the tour of which privilege shall be compared. The, this is um, sort of the, the language, the way they spoke, so it's a bit mixed up, sorry. Yeah. Uh, the fire of the elder linen of Kinvara, the lively and perennial fire of Inish Murray, and St. Moynihan's fire in Kinvara. The monks of Kilmainham lived on a highly fertile ridge, with good grazing for cattle. The two rivers adjacent to the settlement, the Kamak and the Liffey, provided ample opportunities for fishing, fish being the staple diet of the monastic, uh, 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 the, the, monk, the monks. Besides a complement of 27 monks, the settlement would have had tenant farmers and other lay people in residence. St. Moynihan's monastery, or Kiel, would not have been a large structure, but judging by other surviving ruins from that area, it was more likely to have been a small stone-built church with a stone-clad roof circled by wooden huts. Moynihan's exact date of birth and death are not known, but it's established that his monastery still existed in 780 AD. Ages passed and the church fell into ruin. Weeds grew on the pastures and ivy on the walls. The Viking invaders settled on the banks of the Liffey and, ra and ravaged what they could and scared the monks away from their peaceful retreat. Until around the church and in the mid those hills came a trampling army of deliverance. Yeah, yeah. I'm just talking about the church there. This is, what is the basis? This is a painting that I did. 
and it envisages uh, a sort of romantic view of what Kilmain would have looked like in the year 700. This is a sculpture of St. Martin, which we commissioned and which is on show in the library at Kilmain. Um, Unfortunately, it's not accessible, but it will be uh, in a very year's time when they complete the renovations of the library. <laughs> Eventually, Brian Carew came to Kilmain to do battle against the Vikings. In 1013, the white tents of his camp were pitched along this green valley of Kilmainham as troop after troop arrived. The knights and foot soldiers practiced their arts, and when the pale crescent of the moon rose up lining the lines of their banners and pennants shimmered in the gleaming air, all the wilderness, in wilderness was a gorgeous uh, panoply of war. Here the sight was renewed night after night until Christmas of that year, 1014, and uh, until the bleak December days, King Brian abandoned his camp at Kilmainham and marched back to Clare. Then on Easter Sunday the following year, they came back to Kilmainham and crossed the Niffy, this time being victorious. But the grandson of King Brian was born in stately sorrow upon a bloody shield from the triumphal field of Clontarf to these slopes here at Kilmain. Solemnly he was buried in the sacred ground where St. Mine is also buried and where the shaft still stands. I, uh, many of you probably have seen the shaft and unfortunately as the years go by it seems to be the patterns uh, seem to be getting worn off by the rain. The shaft is opposite, uh, on the opposite side of the Bully's Acre, where the Templars and Hospitallers were buried. Brian Maria's grandson was not buried under the cross, as had previously been suggested, but in front of it. When the cross fell over, a sword was found under it. It is thought to have been a Viking sword. Strongbox. Not too long after this war between the Irish chief and Scott Strongbow to Ireland, and he chose the man as being ideal for a priory or castle for the order of the Knights Temple. Here in 1174, upon the ruins of St. Mynard's Church, the carpenter and stone mason came and the foundations were laid for the noblest priory which by far famed Templars possessed in the whole of Europe. An amusing account is given that King Rodri, that Rodri, King of Connacht, advancing from Castlenock uh, to, uh, to Kilmainham, blockaded Strongbow into Dublin and forced him to acknowledge Rod Rodri as his sovereign. But Hugh de Coghill, who was one of the priors of Kilmainham, uh, one of his aides said he would die rather than submit and persuaded Strongbow to ride out to command him. Now, Strongbow was probably at Christ Church or where Christ Church was. Now. To ride out to command him. And they cut through the crowd so that Roderick barely escaped with his life and a state of, in a state of nudity, having been bathed in the Kamak River. So it was that all along the banks of the Liffey and Kamak lay the possessions of the Knights Temple. Vast gardens and orchards were arranged and ordered around their magnificent fortress. Here for 128 years, they kept watch and war, and sometimes engaged in battles with tribes from, hit, from the hills, sometimes hunted and driven to bay by the old ones and the old tools. Many a choir ruled over them and their commanderies in Ireland until the days of King Edward II when Walter de Waters, who was Grand Prior of Kilmain at the time, then a decree was made by the Pope and the Kings of England and France that the order was to be suppressed. All our possessions, including that of Kilmain, were given to the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, otherwise known as the Knights of Malta. And they, were, and they maintained their rule here at Kilmain until the reign of Henry VIII, when they too were suppressed in 
are. The priors of command were very often the king's deputies in Ireland. Roger Nankla, or Rotla, uh, Etna Massey, who lived there in command, were all a very beautiful folk. So he devoted to the exploits of Roger Nankla, who was very important president uh, in the country and in command. Roger Nankla was prior of command for North, nearly 40 years, during which time he was the most powerful man in Ireland. He was the most significant of the 42 priors of command and ultimate dissolution by Henry VIII in 1540. As a Knight Temp customer, he was basically appointed by the King Edward II to do an inventory of all the lands and possessions that had been confiscated from the Knights Temple in Ireland. He produced a book called The Extent of Command in Latin, so it has a Latin title which gives much of the information that we have from that time. In 1317, Outlaw convened a parliament at Comaine, in which he secured the release of Richard de Borgo, the Earl of Ulster, who had been imprisoned by the mayor, the mayor and commons of Dublin on suspicion of aiding the Scottish invasion of Ireland by Robert the Bruce. In 1318, uh, Outlaw was made Lord Treasurer of, of Ireland, whereupon he bound himself as a successor to pay £300 a year to the Archbishop of Dublin for the exercise of Episcopal jurisdiction. Also in 1318, King uh, Edward, recognising the success of Outlaw's organisational skills and charitable work, of the monastery granted that all taxes accruing to Ireland for the ensuing year should be paid towards the support of the poor who were flocking to Kermain. Elkhop played an important part in securing peace between many various factions in Ireland. A vicious civil war <laughs> broke out among the Norman barbers, with the Fitzgeralds and the Butchers and the Fairlings on one side and the Bogues and the, the, the Pars on the other. The native Irish took the opportunity to engage in attacks on both sides of their, uh, of their common enemy. Their activity compelled the Barons to feel that they were being engaged in a war of self-extermination. Outlaws addressed themselves with creditable zeal to establish peace among the native chieftains, having gained no advantage in a permanent, of a permanent character from their constant struggles offered to submit themselves to the government and Outlaw thus prevailed. Outlaw petitioned the king to have the whole body of English law applied to Ireland. An offer of 8,000 marks was offered, but the king, the English administration, rejected the offer in the belief that the condition in Ireland was, too, it was in too great a ferment and commotion. Irish chieftains were most anxious to secure the protection of the common law, but the English invaders wanted the freedom to annex property, the property of the native Irish. Outlaw had to contend with the newly created heirs of Desmond, Ormond, Ulster, Mead, Kildare, Leeds and Kilkenny, Wexford and Carlow, as well as the native chieftains of the O'Neills, the McCartans, the O'Rourke's, the O'Dempsey's, the O'Connors, the O'Toole's, Mike Morris and the O'Reilly. Outlaw travelled to London on two occasions in 1323 and again in 1341 to report to the king on the state of things in Ireland. In 1341 he assisted the king's finances with a loan of 200 pounds. In 1341 the king affirmed the possessions of Cullain among the Roger Outlaw. In 1348 the king rewarded Outlaw for his long service and loans of money with the custody of the manor of, of the Salmon Lee in Leeds. In 1341, Outlaw, still prior, and Lord Justice of Ireland died at Knockhamley in County Limerick, described as a proven and upright man who, by his care and special favour and license of the king, had procured many lands, churches, and rents for the order of the Knights Hospital.
the Rhine Hospital. The Rhine Hospital is a mile and a half west of the city, of the city centre, and at the time of its construction, the domain enjoined the whole of the Phoenix Park. The hospital was built in 1684 by Sir William Robinson, official state surveyor for General James Butler, first Duke of Ormond, and Lord Lieutenant of Ireland to King James II as a home for retired soldiers and continued and it continued in that use for 250 years. At this juncture it, it would be I would point out that the same Butlers built Kilkenny Castle. And if you want to get some idea of the grandeur of these buildings, you should visit Kilkenny Castle. Is that you, you, that, when you visit the Kenny Castle, you will see exactly what the, the, the decoration and everything, the grandeur of those buildings, the buildings at that time, what they were like. And the Kenny Castle still captures it. The Royal Hospital doesn't because it's been turned into the Museum of Modern Art and because uh, apart from the state park is there, you don't really get any of the because where the soldiers were uh, had their rooms at the high up and that is all open space you now. You can't get the you can't get the feel for what it was like. The Royal Hospital Command was based on Les near blades and parts, and the building consists of uh, uh, consists of four unbroken ranges enclosing the courtyard. The Royal Hospital of Command had a previous significant history. As we have seen, it was the site of St. Monument's Church in the 7th century, Brian Burrell assembled at Command, the Battle of Clontarf. Later, the same site was there for Strongwell, who built his monastery there. The artillery barracks bar bar at Island Bridge was contiguous to the lands of the Royal Hospital. And that's very important. The artillery barracks was a hugely important uh, feature in this area and it's mentioned in many, many um, his histories of both English and Irish history, the, the artillery barracks there. The construction of the modern hospital was recognised even in today as a significant bulwark for the uh, English administration in Ireland. Many of the viceroys and commanders in chief operated from the Royal Hospital Command. General Nick Lake who defeated the rebellion of 1798 was headquartered at the Royal Hospital. Robert Emmett, who led the battle, uh, who led uh, the rebellion in 1803, was particularly concerned to isolate the Royal Hospital and uh, cut it off from access to the city. Uh, Field Marshal Garrett Walsley, who was born in Golden Bridge House just across the road here, uh, was the most decorated general in the history of the British Army. In 1890, he was raised to the Privy Council and appointed Commander in Chief in Ireland. He enjoyed a peaceful term during his lodgings at the Royal Hospital. He devoted his time to reading and writing a series of articles for the Pall Mall Gazette, which were later published in a collection as the decline and fall of Napoleon. General Maxwell was based at the head army at Army headquarters in the Royal Hospital of Lane from September 1902 to 1904. He became the general officer commanding British troops in 1908 and was then deployed to the Western Front in the First World War. However, General Maxwell is best known for his controversial handling of the 1916 rising. Maxwell arrived on the 28th of April as the military governor with plenary powers under martial law, replacing Lovett Friend as the primary uh, British military commander in Ireland. Afterwards, he set, he set about dealing with the rebellion under the misunderstanding, under his, his understanding of martial law. During the second week to the 9th of May, Maxwell was in sole charge of the trial and sentences by Field General, Field General Court Martial, in which trials were conducted without defence counsel 
are generally members in, in, in Cameron, in other words, in private. He had 3,400 people arrested, and 183 civilians were tried, 90 of whom were sentenced to death, and 14 were shot uh, between the 4th and 12th of May. In 1916, British soldiers were able to fire. The British soldiers were able to fire their rifles from the roof of the Royal Hospital into the South Dublin Union, which was the biggest battle site uh, in 1916. Now, Bully's Acre, which is also on the ground of the Royal Hospital. Uh, was the most popular cemetery in Dublin prior to 1842. Apart from Robert Dennett, the most famous person buried there was the boxer Dan Downey, who had 80,000 people attend his funeral. It was the only free burial place for the poor in Dublin. <coughs> it thereafter continued to be used until the cholera outbreak in 1842, when 3,200 interments took place in six months and the government, afraid of COVID, closed it down. Kermaine um, Jail. I won't say much about Kermaine Jail because I'm sure everybody knows here about Kermaine Jail and you can visit there and get a tour. Apart from the fact that um, the Henry John McCracken was the first uh, uh, political prisoner held there. It was built in, in 90, 1796. And a lot is to be said about Tremaine and about ordinary prisoners there. A lot of focus is put on the Republican prisoners who were like, executed there, etc. So I won't go into that and I'll just get on to a couple of less dramatic thing. Island Bridge. In 1671, Sir John Temple built the wall that now encloses the Phoenix Park for the preservation of the deer. Sir John was the only one of many dignitaries who lived at Island Bridge, which was one of the most fashionable and prosperous areas of the city at that time. Lord Galway, who was one of the Lord Justices in Dublin Castle. He lived on Island Bridge and persuaded the authorities of the Royal Hospital to permit him to have a, a right of way through the hospital to make it easier to get to Dublin Castle. And this became known as Lord, Lord Galway's Walk. It didn't mean that he actually walked because they used to be carried around in deep seated chairs. So we'd have or minion, or his minion, to carry him in a chair. I'm sure, have you ever seen we had, had these things to put on our shoulder? Four men had a seat and chair on the shoulder, and Lord God was sitting there going through the, through the, his, his wall. In 1789, a petition by William Wardington of the city of Dublin, a petition of merchant, a, a merchant and calico printer was presented to the Houses of Parliament, setting forth that the petitioner, who was for many years past carried on a business of linen and cotton printing at Island Bridge, the petitioner begged leave to observe the manufacturing calico in this kingdom is arrived to so great a perfection that they're only wanting uh, completely printing works to render it entirely equal to that of burden and consequently to put a stop to the importation of such goods which would be the means of saving many thousands of pounds annually to the exchequer of this nation. These considerations have been induced, have induced petitioner to contract with government co corporation for some grounds at island page watered by the living a most commodious and convenient place for carrying on the calico printing. That the petitioner has engaged the calico printer from England, a man of great experience and abilities, 
under whose immediate advice and assistance the petitioner has in the course of the last summer erected a complete printing factory. This, I remind you, is 1671. Oh no, uh, seven, sorry, 18, 1789. So they had a massive printing, calico printing work at Iron Bridge in uh, 1779.